Amazing Grace was a carnival queen, though she never was rich or famous. She traveled the land with Sideshow Dan and his true life freaks of nature. And they say that Grace had a giant brain, her IQ was 150. She had tattooed over every inch of her skin, and man, she sure was pretty. She could lift a man with either a hand and twirl one in her teeth. She could bend her back like an acrobat and juggle with her bare feet. Amazing grace, how sweet she was. It's all about relationships. You know, everything I've ever gotten has come from a relationship with somebody. And I think that has to apply in every field. Scratch Entrepreneur. True stories of remarkable people who dropped everything to turn an idea into a healthy, profitable business. Today on the program, lifelong musician Jason Wilbur joins us to share his story, offer a few secrets to his success, and open up about the vision and timeline around his new solo album. When he and I sat down in his studio, we started from the beginning, reflecting on the music in his childhood home. Really, with where I heard the music that, that attracted my attention was on the radio, and, uh, and also and my parents had a, a small record collection on a little record player in our living room. This is when I'm maybe four years old. Uh, and I remember at some point I kind of discovered how to operate it. You know? And so I had some of my kid records, like Disney records or records with stories on them, which had music, of course, but once I started listening to my dad's record, um, there were three records that like kind of became my holy trinity, for yeah, lack of yeah, a better term, yeah, at, yeah. Age, at age over four and or over five. Over yeah. Those again. So, and the first one that I, I happened upon was a Tom T. Hall record called In Search of a Song, which I later named my radio show after. Oh, cool. um, and the thing I loved about it, I think, as a kid, is those songs are mostly just stories set to music. So I love that. I love there was uh, that record. I start, you know, played it enough that my started to drive my parents crazy. You know, there was a song in there called "Who's Gonna Feed Them Hogs," and that was my favorite one. And I would play that one over and over. He'd lie there and cry out in a medicated fog. Here I am in this dang bed, and who's gonna feed them hogs? Four. Right around the same time, I discovered Marty Robbins record gunfighter ballads and trail songs very similar stories although those were about the west they were just great just exciting stories with some drama you know what was fun about those stories tom t hall's stories were more slice of life which i loved but the right. stories on the marty robbins gunfighter ballads and trail songs were more dramatic you know because it'd be about like a cattle drive or a robbery or a murder or you know other kind of cowboy ballady type stuff to the town of Alfre, who rode a stranger one fine day. Hardly spoke to folks around him, didn't have too much to say. No one dared to ask his business, no one dared to make a slip. The stranger there among them had a big iron on his hip, big iron on his hip. So those songs, you know, had the drama and everything. And then the third record that uh, was part of that three record group was uh, Johnny Cash at San Quentin. And now that was, those were also stories, but much rawer uh -huh. and much more kind of grown up. So those were exciting just because I felt like, wow, this is like grown up. But I loved it still because the, the emotion and, and the power of it was just awesome. And so those were great. That's what really got me excited about music. You know, um, I just, I felt like as a kid, music was kind of this magic thing that you could put on and it would transport you somewhere you know I would run around the house and play you know like have one of those you know stick horses that you would ride and listen to the Marty Robbins songs you know and be like the cowboy you know and later I would you know I had the, my dad had a cheap guitar and I had a little toy guitar as a kid and I would put those on and pretend I was playing you know so I got older I, I remember bought I think the first record I bought for myself was an Elvis Presley greatest hits record and then as I 
got older, I, my kind of my horizons would expand. You know, like, oh, I discovered my sister had a record collection. And mm -hmm. so then I found all this music of like 70s pop rock music, you know, yeah. what was on the radio. So that kind of the, the aha moment on guitar was when I was around maybe fifth or sixth grade, yeah. my uncle, my dad's brother, my uncle Jim, got interested in guitar mm -hmm. and he had a couple of guitars that were nicer instruments than mm -hmm. the one I had access to at home. Right. And so we went to visit him and he was playing songs and had, you know, books with the words and the chords and he would play things and and I tried to play one of his guitars I was like oh my god this is so much easier like you can actually push the strings down and it mm -hmm. sounds like it's supposed to so that was a big aha uh -huh. I was like wow so if I just got a guitar that was better it'd be a lot easier to learn to play it <laughs> yeah, which sounds so totally. obvious but I had no idea you know I just thought wow guitar is really hard you know how does anybody do this yeah. he was about my age Back before the coal mines Bought up all the land Great Uncle Jim went to work in the mines When he was still a young man From that moment on, Jason was hooked. He got songbooks and started learning basic chords for all his favorite songs. A neighbor down the street got a guitar too, and it all got more fun because they were learning together. Fifth grade turned into middle school, and Jason got a new electric guitar. He was chugging right along when he got the biggest break a middle school kid can. A band full of older guys needed a guitar player. One of them heard Jason's chops, and he was in. At 12 years old, Jason was playing rockabilly standards and Elvis songs in the fraternal clubs of Fort Wayne, Indiana. The crowds were mostly Vietnam vets looking to hear their favorite late 50s, early 60s songs from before they went to war. Jason's band had the youth, the style, and it didn't really matter if they were any good. They represented exactly what the audiences at the Elk Clubs and Moose Lodges wanted to remember, being young and listening to their favorite songs. Jason was making great money for a 13-year-old and loving every tiny gig, every smelly hall, every chance to play for an audience. And then, out of nowhere, his mom announced that they were moving. Fell out of bed and I laid on the floor So the day had started like so many before Nowhere to turn when you want to roll No one to talk to, no place to go In the afternoon or in the evening and Now all this newfound free time doesn't mean much Maybe it just takes time. I was initially bummed out, you know, because I had to leave my band and leave all the people I knew who played and who were my friends. And um, But I discovered after not too long that music, Bloomington was a very vibrant mm -hmm. music town. You know, there were tons of great bands because of the giant music school, and it's mm -hmm. still that way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, pretty soon I had lots of friends who played, and I got in a, a couple, few different bands. The move from Fort Wayne to Bloomington, Indiana turned out to be a good thing, and Jason jumped right back into bands that played 50s and 60s songs in Elks Clubs and Moose Lodges. In Bloomington, though, the music scene was pulsing, and Jason quickly realized that the sky was the limit. He was 15 now, and looking to find different gigs that were more a part of the bustling music nightlife. But again, he was 15. He was in bands with guys in their 20s and 30s, but they still had to swing by his house and pick him up for gigs since, you know, he didn't have a driver's license yet. So he needed a plan for how to get into these clubs, even though he was underage. Here is the point in the story where Jason really shows his true hustle. He wanted something, and he wasn't going to let a little thing like age stop him from getting it. Places, and I said hey, can I be your guitar tech? You know, because I learned that was a way I could, like, get in and watch the band. So you're not getting paid anything no. for it, but, like... just get to get in, and I stand there, and if, like, something goes wrong, it. I'll help them out, I'll help yeah. them set up his gear. Makes them feel cool because they've got a guitar tech. 
And it's great for me because now I get in the bar, you know, where I can't get in it otherwise. Jason used the guitar tech move to get closer to his goal. Yes, he got into bars and was able to see these bands play live, but more importantly, he's established relationships with really good musicians. Legendary Bloomington musicians like Brian Lappin, Craig Brenner, and Katie Aronoff were starting to see Jason on the fringes, just helping out, being present, watching, and learning. And then, like it happens so often, being present paid off. Like with the Raging Texans, like, hey, you play guitar, right? Come and sit in on a song, you know? That's cool. And oddly enough, that's the first place I met John Prine. Okay, cool. It was one night I was in the Bluebird, and uh, I had played with my, my band at, at Happy Hour. Uh -huh. And then um, I, the Raging Texans were playing that night, Friday night, so I just stayed. Like, I knew if I was already there and I didn't make any trouble or you know call attention to myself I could just sit yeah, there and right. listen to music you know and so um, I did and uh, and also I had told like the guys in that band Gordon and Jim I said hey you know if you break a string or something I'm here you know I can I'll, I'll be guitar tech you right. know and so they're like yeah okay that's that's cool and so I did that a lot so whenever they play I would just even if my band wasn't playing and you know, I would go like hey you want to you know they'd be like okay come on in you yeah. know you can sit there don't 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 drink don't you know don't, don't get in trouble yeah um, and then the, sometimes at the end of the night, they would have me come up and play on a song or two, you know, sit in with the band. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. So, so cool yeah. of them and so such a great learning experience for me. But one of these nights, after I, I knew them all pretty well at this point, and um, one night John Prine comes in, you know, yeah. and, and uh, I knew my dad had some John Prine records, you know, so I was mm -hmm. familiar with his name. I knew he's a famous musician, you know, and and so w w one of the guys, Jim Bracken, said, man, I don't, I don't know what to play with John Prine. You know, why don't you... You know, you take my guitar and you play with them. <laughs> no way. And I was like, but we played like a, a good set, like half an hour, it seemed like, or maybe 45 minutes. I don't really remember all the details, but uh, that was really cool. I know you think you're almost grown, but you're never too old for rock and roll. I got the great 28, come on, let's go. Years later, Jason would tour the world as the guitar player for the iconic singer-songwriter John Prine. But this first stage experience happened at a local Bloomington nightclub when Jason was a junior in high school. It wasn't some huge break at the time, but it was a sign of things to come. Jason was in the right place at the right time. Not because of magic, luck, or some kind of blind fate. Jason knew what he loved, focused on what he wanted, and put himself in the arena to get it. But at that moment, the John Prine show didn't even really stick out on Jason's radar beyond being something cool he could tell his dad about. So he finished high school and did what you're supposed to do after that, started college. I went to college for one semester, but I've discovered that in order to do the amount of work I needed to do to get good grades in college, it left me no time to mm -hmm. play guitar practice. And so I thought I just ditched that and I just went right. for music full time. So Jason committed for the first time to completely immerse himself in music. He had a formula that had worked for years. Establish relationships, bust your ass to get better at what you do, and walk through as many open doors as possible. His constant pursuit of a better band with more creative musicians was now a full-time gig. It's all about relationships. You know, mm -hmm. Everything I've ever gotten has come from a relationship mm -hmm. with somebody. Yeah. And I think that has to apply in every field. It's something I see in retrospect, you know, like, okay, I got to know these guys, suddenly a gig came out of that. You know, I got to know these guys, suddenly a gig comes from that. Yeah. And when I would, a band would break up or I'd get sick of playing with them or they'd get sick of having me play with them. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I would call my friends and say, hey, mm -hmm. do you know, you know, anybody need a guitar player? And, and a lot of times one of them would go, well, I'm getting ready to leave this band or... No, you know, a guy just asked me last week if I knew anybody. You know, some, I yeah. just got gigs like that. And I kind of was gradually working my way up so that by the time I was around 21, mm -hmm. I was kind of at what I thought was the top tier yeah. of, of clubs. In yeah. terms of like you could go there, a big crowd would show up, you could make a lot of money. Yeah. So that's what I did. If I owned a liquor store, be dead inside a year. I just know I couldn't trust myself around all that wine and beer. Your local brewer's got a message for you, but it wouldn't take it to heart. Hey, drink a couple bottles, you get a screw model, and it makes you really smart. 
Jason continued on the top of the Midwest music scene for a few years. He was touring, having fun, and playing great music. Then, like so many chapters before, Jason decided it was time to end that one. The story isn't a new one. He had tons of fun, spent eternities on the road, and run himself ragged. Playing other people's music was getting old, and the challenge just wasn't there anymore. So he stepped away from the touring bar scene for a while, worked a day job at a guitar shop, and started paying more attention to singer-songwriters. And then I just tried to find places to play music because I really liked it. Right. I got into bluegrass music then. Uh -huh. I mean, I'd always enjoyed listening to bluegrass, but I'd never tried to play any of that. started playing in bluegrass bands, and then I started playing with a singer-songwriter named Bill Wilson, mm -hmm. who wasn't a bluegrass guy, but what intrigued me about him was he was a singer-songwriter, mm -hmm. uh, kind of in the vein of, of people I liked, like you know Tom T. Hall or Arlo Guthrie, or you know those mm -hmm. singer-songwriter guys yeah, who right. do kind of folky country rock music, you know, or John Prine. Yeah. Um, and he made records, mm -hmm. and he did his own music. You know, like when he would go do a show, it was 80%, 90% his yeah. songs. So I thought that was really cool, because even though, you know, I didn't play on the records, maybe, mm -hmm. I was still playing with somebody that was their music, and so I felt it was like more close to the source. It was more like I was doing something artistic, you oh, know? yeah, totally. Were you writing at all at this point? I I had always written songs, even as a kid, but I... It was around this point where I started actually maybe playing them for other people or mm -hmm. trying to finish them or trying to you know have it be a real song. Before yeah. it was always just kind of like, hey, I got an idea, I'll write down these words and, and then never think of it again, you know. Yeah. Or, Dude, and yeah. I guess what I didn't really have until my early 20s was the singing. I'd never been the uh -huh. singer. I would sing harmonies. Uh -huh. Maybe in some of the bands I was in, I would sing like one song, right. one or two songs. Yeah. Uh, Kind of reluctantly, you know, but they'd always be like, "Everybody's got to sing at least one song," you know. So I'd learn a, you know, learn a song. <laughs> Crooked people, empty stairs, the windows rattle and the daylight scares. The breeze blows the doors to days long since. With a newfound love of singer-songwriters and a budding interest in sharing his own music with the world. Like many of us, Jason's late 20s are the moment where he truly finds himself. A love for music and playing guitar had been there from the beginning, but now he found a focused part of being a musician that was fulfilling on a whole new level. I discovered I really liked that role of accompanying a singer-songwriter because I would mm -hmm. sort of provide the texture and color mm -hmm. to the, to the kind of the counterpoint to their story and their vocal melody. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really liked that. and. Unfortunately, Bill passed away. I'd only worked with him for less than a year. I think he passed away around Thanksgiving of, boy, 1994, maybe, 93, mm -hmm. somewhere around in there. And uh, uh, I had gotten to know Carrie Newcomer and her husband, Robert Midas. It came out of that that at some point, his, uh, Carrie needed a guitar player. And so they're like, hey, you want to play guitar? You know, right. another relationship yeah. thing led uh -huh. to a gig. Yeah. And also, they were not bar gigs. You know, they were gigs where somebody had paid you know, 10 or 20 bucks okay, to yeah. sit in a seat and listen, uh -huh. which is totally different than somebody who just walks into a bar and maybe yeah. doesn't pay anything and they're right. expecting to hear Tom Petty songs, you know, <laughs> right. totally different environment. And yeah. that was, for me, that's like, that's the environment. I was like, yeah. okay, this is what I want to do. I, I want to play music yeah, yeah. for people who have come to listen to music, not uh -huh. for people who came to drink and also the music is like something else that's yeah. happening. Yeah. Jason's relationship building and pursuit of the better band fostered the connection with Carrie Newcomer, and it was about to get him the gig he enjoys to this day. A role as the guitar playing color guy for John Prine. Let's jump into the story as Jason talks about David Steele, who was John's guitar player at the time and a good friend. Steele played in that band for about a year, maybe a little longer, I can't remember, but he got an offer from Steve Earle uh -huh. to come play in his band. Cool. And so that was a really like a really hard decision for him because there's two people he's really like a huge fan of. And um, 
What a cool position. To what be. a great, I know that's, we had that conversation. It was like, well, you really can't go wrong. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have absolutely. two awesome people who want you in their band. And, yeah. and so for whatever reason, he decided, I think he felt like, you know, well, I've already played with John Prine for this period of time. I should take this other opportunity, you know, to play with someone else grow. who's great, you know, yeah. which ended up being great for me because right. he recommended me for the yeah. gig. Um, and he said, I'm going to recommend you to John, you know, yeah. for this and and so he tells me this in like maybe July or August mm -hmm. or October, I can't remember. It was like of one year, it must have been 1995. Oh. And then nothing. I don't hear anything. You know, I sent like John a letter with a <laughs> tape, you know, like back then a cassette tape. And right. someone said, hey, here's what I've done. Here's some uh -huh. samples of my playing and recordings and so live. You really and, wanted that gig. You oh, went out there and really yeah, obviously. Yeah, I like did, I, what like, did what I, everything I thought I could do, you yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really have any access to them other than just mailing them a letter and a tape. And then just heard nothing for like, it seemed like three or four months. I mean, it might have been a month. You know, I don't remember <laughs> now, but it was like, it got to the point where it was like, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, and no surprise because whatever the song goes, there's 1,500 and however many guitar pickers in Nashville. You know, that's, yeah. he's got a lot of choices. Um, and so I get a phone call one day and it's John Prine's manager saying, hey, you know, John heard about you from Larry and from David. They really recommend you. You know, you yeah. say you're really good. You want to audition for John's band, basically. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, well, of course uh, I do, you know. Yeah. It'd be like a dream come <laughs> true. Yeah, it's like, what, tell me the time. So I did, and I got the job, and I went on, we went on the first tour we did. Actually, the funny thing is, I think the first tour we did was the longest tour I ever did with John. So that was just amazing. That was like really, all of a sudden I'm on a tour bus, I'm making more money than I've ever made, yeah. um, playing all these really great venues, you know, yeah. with an artist, a real, a legitimate genius, you know, yeah. someone who's really like at the top of their field. Right. Um, so it was huge. It was just huge. And it was like, I really did have that sensation of, wow, this is a dream come true. Uh, it was everything I wanted it to be, you know, better hotels, better food, uh -huh. better get, you know, better venues, more money, more uh, adulation from yeah. people, you know, people like, oh, wow, you know, you, okay. You play with John. You play with John right? Prine, yeah. you know, and you really, uh, I yeah. mean, my playing hadn't improved any from that, like, you know, three months earlier when I'd been <laughs> doing whatever, you know, right. but suddenly you know people could and context it has a big effect on people's perception of a performance yeah you know that's a good point in context business in general too, and business and, and there's it's totally like that in businesses you know if somebody walks into your store or whatever people will take you seriously in proportion to how seriously you're presented in 1996, Jason had found the biggest gig of his career. He was working with one of his idols, playing beautiful concert halls across the country, and enjoying not the life of a rock star, but even better, the life of an artist, living his dream without most of the distractions he'd had in touring bands before. And here Jason teaches us another lesson. He'd been searching for a bigger, better band his whole life, but when he reached the mountaintop, he didn't self-sabotage or get an ego about being his own frontman. He had a good gig, and he was smart enough to realize it. Since 1996, Jason has been best known as John Prine's guitar player, and he's never had a problem with that. But I'm calling it quits, I'm tired of it, this perpetual goodwill While Jason was ecstatic to be playing with John Prine, he also started building a solo career in his spare time. But getting a gig that represented where he wanted to play was tough. People simply didn't know his music enough. When Jason and I spoke on the phone prior to this interview, he offered a metaphor for the difference between the John Prine gig and his own singer-songwriter career. The first, he said, is like a yacht sailing the Gulf of Mexico. The second is a fishing boat with a hole or two in it and an old rusty motor. 70-30 uh, kind of a thing. You know, 70% yeah. of what I was doing was playing with other people. 
yeah. who already had built up a following and could, you know, where I could make a good amount of money and make a living working with them. Right. And then maybe the 30% was, well, when I had time, I'd go play my gigs where I didn't really make any money, but I got to play songs that I'd written and I got to sing mm -hmm. and kind of explore a little different part of my music mm -hmm. world or life that I didn't get to in that other context necessarily. Um, but I always liked doing both of them. You know, I always really enjoyed being kind of being the voice of, of the performance and expressing my own ideas in words and, 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 and songs. But I also really enjoyed being the guy who was accompanying the person doing that. And uh -huh. just, you can't really do both. Right. I mean, there are some people who do a really good job of accompanying themselves. You know, most of the singers I play with are also playing an instrument. But I'm really the accompanist, uh -huh. you know, or right. I mean, I'm one of them if it's yeah, a band, yeah, you know, yeah. the behold, the whole band is the accompanist. Yeah. But that's it's sort of a counterpoint. It's a balance that's happening. It's a dialogue that's mm -hmm. happening between that person and the music, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you what I really like about being that counterbalance is that I don't know, I just get to participate in a way that's different mm -hmm. from if I'm in the center of it, I'm the person singing. Mm -hmm. That's really fun too, but it's a different experience and I really like both experiences, you know. So yeah. I never wanted to give up one for the other. I love to watch the wind in the locust trees and the way the sun feels so warm on me and on you too. And everyone who has come to sit out in this lazy afternoon You swear you can smell those flowers blow I believe you can I smell them too and the grass so green I mean it really makes me feel so good, so good If I knew how I'd get some colors on a brush And set us all down on a big canvas right here We could sit for a few hundred years Jason has always loved his role on the yacht, but sometimes you just need to tow the old rusty boat out to the nearest lake, motor over to a hidden cove, and fish for a while. So he has. Jason has released five solo albums since the late 90s. Most have remained under the radar, and Jason never really pushed it. But that brings us to 2013. Jason's youthful musical escapades have grown into a long-standing career. It can't be said that he wears diamonds on the soles of his shoes, but music has treated him well. Playing shows with John Prine continued to be fulfilling, but he needed a challenge, a musical challenge. When I got to be around, around uh, 40, I was thinking about you know music and my evolution as a musician, mm -hmm. and uh, you know... I, been playing with John for a long John Prine for a long time. At that point, I played with a lot of other people I respected, and I felt really fortunate to do that. I made quite a few records of my own. Mm -hmm. I'd done a lot of that, and I was looking for a, a place to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can always get better at whatever you're doing, but I was. It was more about. Um, I kind of sat back and I thought, how? What can I do? What What's kind of missing when I look at what I'm doing for mm -hmm. myself? I realized it would really be a challenge for me to try to become a much better vocalist because that wasn't where I started. Right. You know, I started just playing guitar and I always loved songs and music, but I always kind of had someone else singing them, you yeah, know? Right. And so I started making my own records mainly because I was a songwriter too, but I had never put any work really into singing. You know, I just always kind of opened my mouth and sang and I never really even thought about it. I always had assumed uh, and I think this is a common assumption. Um, I just thought, well, if you're a great singer, you're a great singer. You know, you you know that when you start singing. People go, hey, you're a great singer. And you go, yeah, I am. And there you go. Right. And people who open their mouths and just are okay, well, you're an okay singer. Uh -huh. right. Which is kind of stupid. I mean, 
because I never would have thought, like, I picked up the guitar and it didn't sound that great at first. So I thought, well, I guess I guitar is not for me. Yeah. So I, I realized that I had this assumption that the way I sing now is the best I can ever do. And, and I didn't think it was that great. And I thought, well, what if I challenge that? You know, what if I really try to become a, a really good singer? Cool. Um, I didn't know if I could do it. But I thought that's kind of like if I look at this point in my life, what's a frontier? You know, what's a challenge for me, a mountain to climb at this point? Um, which I think is a great, whatever your field, is to have that thing that like suddenly you feel like you did when you were 15 or whatever. And you feel like, wow, this is really, I'm really working and I'm this challenge. Uh -huh. So I did. I picked that challenge. You know, okay, I'm going to become a much better singer. And so I started kind of this odyssey of like, I thought, I'm going to give myself three months. I was like, three to six months, I'm going to come up with like the most intensive program. I'm going to figure out the right way to do it. Three to six months, I'm going to really buckle down yeah. like hours a day, you know, really go to the woodshed, as we say in music, and, yeah, totally. and really practice. Uh -huh. And um, I did. So Jason bought books, downloaded videos, sought out advice from great singers, and made it his mission to become a better singer. Three months turned into six, six became a year, and the voyage continued. His time in the woodshed ended up extending over a few years. But like with every other phase in Jason's career, he continued searching for the right avenue. Once he found it, practice became progress, and progress became success. Fortunately, one of the strengths I have I've learned over the years is that I'm I'm disciplined and uh -huh. I can really work hard at something and come back every day yeah I can face discouragement you know and <laughs> yeah, still come back going, yeah. which is, is essential if you want to learn to do something like play an instrument or, or sing or something like that so yeah. fortunately I had that ability to sound bad and 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 be discouraged yeah. you know and realize it was part of a long-term plan so anyway after a few years I really did make a huge improvement and realized an unexpected benefit of that was that when I felt like my singing improved a lot, I suddenly enjoyed music a lot more oh, too. Yeah. You know, it really deepened my appreciation and the pleasure I got from from performing as a singer and as a you know, as a musician in general. My riches can't buy three to six month uh, odyssey <laughs> yeah. it turned into a three to four year odyssey yeah. you know um, I was like well this is great and and I wanted to one of the things I'd done for myself during that time was I'd picked out songs that I loved but I'd always just assumed were way too difficult too for me cool. to sing as, yeah. a, as a vocalist mm -hmm. and I made those some of my challenges that I would work on you know cool. um, and so at the end of that like four years uh, there were some of those songs that I could actually play and, and play well enough to do at a gig. The one that really comes to mind is A Song For You by Leon Russell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started, I did that at a couple of gigs and I, people would come up to me and go, wow, that's fantastic. You know, that's like really, mm -hmm. you know, I was getting, started getting this reaction that was uh, better than any mm -hmm. reaction I'd ever gotten, you know. Right. So that was really fun and I thought, wow, I have this, you know, A Song For You I really love, I'd like to record it. and. I just had the idea of like, well, I've learned some other songs during this time that are by other writers, you know. So I had these songs I liked and I thought, well, I'm going to do a, a whole album of songs by other people. Huh. Because that brought up another kind of creative opportunity, which you'll appreciate as an art teacher, uh -huh. which was to remove an element, uh -huh. was remove yeah. an, one of the options, yeah, you know. Absolutely. And so always on my record, I'd sung mostly like 95% songs that I'd written. Right. So I thought, well, what if I made a record where I didn't write any of the songs? Uh -huh. So that immediately gave me a different perspective on all of it. Stuff it's stuff. kind of the freedom, I mean, I would think of it as kind of the freedom paradox, uh -huh. which is if you take away something, it actually frees you up in other ways that you couldn't appreciate until that thing was removed. So Jason decided to make an album of songs written by other artists and feature his voice in a way that he'd never attempted before. 
right away he knew the perfect person to help him. Paul Mahern is a legendary Bloomington engineer who's put together tons of successful albums, most notably for John Mellencamp. Jason had known Paul for years, but they'd never connected on an album. So Jason called, Paul agreed, and they started developing the idea. One more relationship he built over the years opened the perfect door right when he needed it. He instantly had some great suggestions about, like, he's like, I totally get the kind of record you want to make, and I named a lot of other singer-songwriters who are kind of in my genre, uh-huh. right. you know, yeah. and, and I said, I want to do the songs. I haven't picked them out, you know, but I'd like to do a Towns Van Zandt song, mm-hmm. and I'd like to do a song by these other guys. And he said, well, those are great songs, you know, but when you go, why go pick someone who does something very similar to what you do and do one of their songs, you know, uh-huh. why not pick, like, people who are really different yeah, than yeah, what you do? Yeah. And I thought, duh, that's what a great idea, uh-huh. you know, so, and... And so he had some great suggestions. You know, he suggested some uh, uh, some songs. We kind of together came up with a couple dozen songs or maybe three dozen songs and when it was all said and done and then kind of whittled. You know, I would work through them and try to figure out which ones I felt I could do something with, meaning, you know, how can I... Is this a song that I can do in a way that's unique mm-hmm. and in a way that feels like it's authentic? It's hard to, it's almost like when you put on a, a shirt uh-huh, or a jacket right. and yeah. you look in the mirror. Sometimes you go, oh my God, this was made for me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And sometimes you look yeah. and you go, oh, this is not working. Yeah. Or sometimes you go, well, this is meant to be something else, but if I do it like this, uh-huh. it really works in a different way for me. The big man, he's not listening. His eyes hold Edith. Left hand holds his right. What does that hand desire? He grips it so tight. Well, the goal was to take these songs that might initially seem uh, incongruous and make them uh, all uh-huh. a part of one thing. So, like, there's a David Bowie song in there, Oh, You Pretty Things, uh-huh. which was a song I didn't even really know before we started working on this. It's one that Paul Mahan recommended. Uh-huh. But I found a way to do it that really works for me, uh, and I think it, it's, it's a lot of fun. All the strangers came today And it looks as though they're here to stay Oh, you pretty things Don't you know you're driving your mamas and papas insane Uh, there's a Stevie Wonder song called Overjoyed, you know, uh-huh. um, which is a really challenging song and a song I'd really loved for a long time. Uh, and I just found a way to do it differently so that it felt like me, you know. Yeah. I, I I tried to kind of play it like Stevie Wonder's version and it was fun. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, uh, I'm not him. So I had to had to find a different way to to do it. it oh! Like there's a Pink Floyd song on there, for uh-huh. instance, yeah. Yeah. which is the Pink Floyd version is like 20 minutes long, right? Because like 15 minutes of it is instrumental jamming. You What's know, the name of the song? Uh, it's Echoes, oh, actually, okay. the, cool. the, which yeah. is the title ended up being the title track of the album, and uh, and that's one another one Paul Mahern suggested. And he said, "Look, you know, this is a great song, yeah. but like the it's like 20 minutes long. So just why don't you go and cut out all the instrumental stuff and just put together the." verses the parts where there's words yeah. and just do it as a song you know as a four four or yeah. five minute yeah. song and that he was right it was a great idea and that's what yeah. i did no one sings me lullabies and no one makes me close my eyes so i throw the windows wide and call to you 
across the sky Jason's new album Echoes can be found on iTunes at jasonwilber.com or on his Facebook page Jason Wilbur Music. While you're there, check out his previous albums and a link to his radio show in search of a song. Special thanks to Jason Wilbur for taking the time to share his story with us. If you enjoyed this podcast, there's a couple of things we need you to do right now. First, subscribe to Scratch Entrepreneur on iTunes so you can hear future episodes as soon as we release them. Once that's done, please share a link to this episode on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you get social. We truly appreciate your listening.